Hey everybody, Graham here from TheRecordingRevolution.com and I'm at GearFest 2012 at Sweetwater Sound and I'm sitting next to Fab Dupont. Uh, can I say legendary? Legendary mixer? I don't know what, it's a point of view. It is a point of view. We'll say legendary mixer, engineer, musician, um, educator. He's worked with Jennifer Lopez, tons of artists. He's mixing nonstop. He's also, it's curious because he has a website called Pure Mix, where he kind of does stuff like I'm doing. He trains, he teaches, um, and he's hilariously funny, and uh, has been doing some cool workshops this weekend here at Sweetwater, but I thought he'd be a great person to sit down and talk with. We've kind of dialogued a bit the last year. Um, I really admire your work, and I, I love that you have fun with it. I love that you actually, and you're a great teacher also. I've learned a lot from your videos, and I think uh, people watching this might really enjoy just to hear a little bit about your background, what you're doing, and why you do what you do. So maybe tell me what got you into music, playing it, making it, how do you get to be a mixing engineer today? The short version. Short version? Oh, I got into music, that's easy. My father could never play an instrument, so at the ripe age of five, he pulled me to the conservatory and said, you will play saxophone, because he wanted to play saxophone. The teacher said he's too young, so at the ripe age of six, exactly one year later, he walked me back into the same conservatory in the same teacher state. He's still too young. So my father said, well, you're going to take uh, theory lessons then. So he put me into theory lessons. And the year after that, I was declared old enough to be able to play saxophone. It happened to do teeth or something. So my father, that day, took a bus to the center of Paris, took me to the salmon factory, forced his way in, and got me to choose a saxophone, which I had never played before from a line of freshly off the work, you know, yeah. assembly line saxophones. I picked one because it was gold and silver, which I thought was pretty That's lovely cool. looking. Picked one, I didn't even know what to do with it. We took it, put it in the box, and that's how I started playing saxophone. And then um, I just played and played and played and got better at it. I started playing piano too, and then um, around the age of 12 or 13, I started playing clubs, jazz clubs in Paris. And then I evolved and I played weddings, nice weddings, and bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and all sorts of weird functions in highly questionable suits. Uh, and then... Um, so you had to get it out as quickly as possible. <laughs> yeah, well, so then I was in bands, and in the band I was always the guy who was willing, willing to read the manual for the, the equipment. There's always one dude in the band who's willing to read the manual. Not that he's any better than the others, he's just willing so to read it. Do it. And so when the off button or the on button is really well hidden, it's always that guy that says, hey, how do you turn that thing on? So I was that guy. And then uh, after a while, <clears throat> once you play enough in the wedding bands, are you playing wedding bands? No, good for you. When you play long enough in the wedding band, there's a fork in the road there where you have to tell yourself, I have two options. Either I'm going to keep playing in the wedding band and I will die of it, yeah. or I'm going to get the hell out of here. So I chose, I chose option B. Okay. And I took all the money that I made doing that and writing jingles and I did all sorts of things. And I shipped myself to the States. So how old are you? I was... Uh, Okay. And then I just. So you're not from the United States originally? I do not know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, and so I got to Berkeley, went through Berkeley, um, studied songwriting. Then I had an epiphany there that I was not ever going to be a good enough saxophone player to be able to be a good enough saxophone player, if that makes sense. Yeah. So then I cowardly abandoned the instrument and moved on to what I was good at, which is tell people what to do and reading manuals. And so I started producing records and writing songs, and I started my band, I sang, did some records, and they were pretty lovely, but <clears throat> I didn't get signed. However, every time I presented my record to an a &R, which I, I, I got to meet quite a few of those wonderful people, every time I got the call back that said, no, we're not going to sign you, mm -hmm. you're too French, you're too this, you're too that, but could you make this guy's record sound like your record because he's oh, yeah, on the yeah. label and we like the way your record sounds. Wow. So that happened once, it happened twice, three times, five times, ten times. So that first record generated a lot of that business. Then I did a second record, now that I knew more people. I said, no, I know the right guys, the smarter ones. We're going to see the beauty in what I do. So then I did the second record. The exact same thing happened. Wow. And, um, and then so that's how I got into producing. I mean, that's how I got into producing because my own uh, project went nowhere, but I got a lot of play and a lot of traction on how it sounded and how it was produced. Very interesting. And then, um, then I went to New York, and in New York, um, it's rough. 
Yeah, so I started mixing songs for free for people. Uh, worked with other artists and engineers. And then what happened is every time I would mix a song, a record for somebody, I would usually produce the next one. And I grew out of that. So tell me about when you record, so you, you get an artist you like, you're, you're going to record. Because people that are watching this, people that are reading my website, or even your website, they, they either are making their own music and they just need it to sound as good as yes. you, know, you just happen to, I guess, naturally be talented at early on when you were trying to get signed. But, or they're working with clients and they, they just want to get better at what they do. They want it to sound better. They have records they know they, that are good, mm -hmm. but theirs aren't as good as that. Um, the talent aside, because you're obviously choosing to work with people you want to work with. Let's say they're just working with themselves and they, I'm recording my own album. I can't swap out the artist. Mm -hmm. When you're purely approaching recording something, like I've seen you know, the way you did it today, when you're, you know, you sort of, you know what you want to do with recording, let's say the drum kit, and it doesn't work, and then you say, well, we'll move the mics here, well, we'll move the mics here, you know, and you kind of play off the, you, you don't really have a script that you're following in terms of, I always like the kick drum like this. Tell me a little bit about how you like to approach that, because it seems that's a freeing way to work, but I think a lot of people that are watching this or read websites or had had training, we get tricked into thinking, well, this is what you're supposed to do every single time to record. You don't seem to be stuck on that. No, and it's a very particular situation. I learned by myself um, failing, sure. Make, making records that didn't sound the way I heard them in my head. Because there's nothing more frustrating than knowing exactly what you want it to sound like, which is right there is very difficult to get to. You know, I don't know many people who are naturally born with the instinct of what a drum set should sound like. Right. Through a pair, through a bunch of microphones and speakers, right there, creating that notion, notion in your head is a journey. Okay, once you create that notion, then you have to achieve the technical knowledge to be able to to achieve that notion in reality. Those are two different things. Number one, you have to have a picture in your head of what you want it to sound like. It doesn't come naturally. Your mother did not give you that gene. Neither did your father. What's giving you that gene is listening to music and being curious and being relentless. So, and having a good memory. So. Those three things allow you to create your taste, form your taste, right? Then once you have taste formed, okay, for example, th this morning when we were recording that drum set, this was probably the worst drum set in the history of the universe, <laughs> all right? Um, it was really bad, really bad drum set. And fun drummer, like yeah. buoyant, crazy yeah. drummer, loud, my goodness, was he loud. And so a bad drum set with a loud drummer is hell, okay? So I stand in front of the drum set and I'm listening to it. Most people don't even go do that. I listen to it and I'm like, oh, okay. So the bass drum goes park, the snare drum goes bleh, and then the cymbals are like, eh. okay, this is my raw material. How do I enhance that or go around that? Now, if you go with the dogma approach, it's like, we should put a dynamic, uh, a dynamic microphone in front of the hole and then a condenser outside the hole. And if you have money, you're going to have a 421 or a D12, etc., etc. Fine, we don't have that. But I still know what I want it to sound like. Okay, so how, how close can I get to what I want it to sound like in my head with what I have? How did I get to what I want it to sound like in my head? Well, they're kind of a rock and roll band, kind of like opposed to Stones with a little bit of Motown in it, and she sounds a little bit like Tina Turner, and she's got a lot of aggressivity in, in her tone and everything. So I've heard those records. I remember what it sounded like. I remember closing my eyes. I can see the picture of what that record was like, where the symbols were. Where the, where the snare was, how low the bass drum came down, right? So I, I listened to that in my head, I'm like, I don't want to do that. That's the thread. That's what people, those are the buttons that I can push and make people feel good about this recording. How can I make it better? Well, first, this is 2012. How about I give the high end is like that, but the bottom hits hard. Because if you listen to older 60s and 70s records, there's no bottom on it. Right. right, okay, fine. So I'm going to need that kind of a snare, this kind of overhead. So I can have some stereo because it's just a quartet. It's a bass, it's most likely going to be in the middle. A guitar, most likely going to be in the middle. A vocal, most likely going to be in the middle. What's going to be on the sides? Nothing. Okay, fine. So I'm going to put my overhead. This is the 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 thought so you're process. You're thinking of the whole band. You're thinking of the whole band, band, and you're thinking of the picture of the aesthetics of you, what you want it to be. Okay, and then there's a certain philosophy you have to think about. All the dogma that I read. And, and watch on tutorial videos and everything comes from initial, initial inspiration from somebody right. years ago. So this is the scenario. Said engineer fails for five years at recording a drum set. One day, 
he stumbles upon a solution. Said engineer makes a lot of money on this record and wants to repeat that magic process. What is he going to do next time? The exact same thing. Right. Said engineer's assistant watches that for five years being done exactly the same time, becomes an engineer, is successful. His assistant is going to take that on. So that's why everybody puts a D112 on the bass drum and a 47 fed outside. Why? Because some dude, back in the day, I don't know whom, stumbled upon that combination in those combinations for those kinds of sounds, for that kind of drums. Now, I see people putting D112s and 47 feds on hip hop drums, like, you know, the neo hip hop with real drums. And I'm like, okay, I don't see it. How are you going to make it go boom? It's going to go poof and pock. But it's not going to go boom because none of those microphones are doing that. Mm -hmm. So there's a, the dogma is basically solidified inspiration from years ago, or it's corrupted information read on the internet, interpreted wrong, badly adapted to situations that don't match. I like to think a different way. I like to listen to the thing and say, A, is the source good? B, if the source is not good, can I change something to it? Like remove the back end on the drum, for right. example. C, can I get that source translated onto the recording without having to, you know, sell my mother uh, for sure. expensive equipment? And then after that, what can I do with that? So, no, I don't have any dogma. I just want to get the thing from live onto the recording. I want it to be painless and possibly fun. And then second, I want to make sure that it makes me feel something. Where the microphone is, honestly, is not that relevant. It's relevant in the spirit of translating your vision. So if you have the vision, the translation happens pretty naturally after that. Most people skip the vision thing. Most people I come and just will switch mic priests and not in the control room, not go in the live room. Yeah. Or if they go in the live room, they listen for five minutes or two minutes or one minute because it's loud in there. And then they go back in the control room and they start EQing stuff. And it's just, that's not how it's going to work. It's never going to make a good record now. So if you're alone at home and you can't get the tones you want, it's, it's hard because you don't have a sounding board and you're not working with somebody. Referencing is the best way. Yeah. If, you, if you put a microphone in front of your guitar and it doesn't sound the way you want it to sound, pull out the latest John Mayer record or pull out an old Neil Young record and just listen to that. Yeah. Take, take a breather and just listen to that. Then once that's that, you're able to learn, teach yourself the differences between your sound and John Mayer's sound, mm -hmm. or your sound and Leon Young's sound, and then over time, you will have the intuition. See, a lot of people run on knowledge base, and knowledge base is beautiful. Sure. But once you integrate all those notions and let them brew in there, then you develop this intuition, where you feel that if you pull the, the bass drum mic back a foot and a half, it's gonna sound just right. There's no manual on that. Right. That's based on the fact that maybe four years ago, some assistant pulled the mic a foot and a half and said, touch nothing, I love the way that sounds. Yeah. And then it's in the back of my head, and it's there. So it's based on experience. That makes sense. The thing that I say, tell people is like, okay, here's the deal. I want to teach you how to um, play guitar. It's really cool, check it out. You come and you watch a two hour seminar, and I'm going to show you everything I know about guitar everything I know. And then tomorrow you're going to play guitar and everybody laughs at me. I'm like, why? Why don't you think that you can learn to play guitar by watching a two-hour seminar if I give you all my information? Right. People don't see the parallel between playing guitar or bass or drums or singing and engineering and producing. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, George Masson just was giving a seminar and said it takes 10,000 hours right. to get good at anything. Right. So you have to put the 10,000 hours you have to have every problem, solve every problem, come up with your own solutions. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what it is. So that's that's the thing. For me, I'm at the point where I no longer function off my knowledge base. I function off my intuition. Yeah. Because I've come through the ranks by having uh, just learning by myself and having so many problems, I remember very well how it feels, and so I'm able to tell people because I know how they feel. Yeah. I know how the, the guy in his basement with just one microphone, one low quality preamp, and one back converter, I know exactly how he feels. I remember very well that feeling. And I remember just how preposterous it was to try and think my way out of that situation, and also how depressing it can be, and how the depression factor makes you think that it's actually worse than it really is. And so that's part of the reason why I, 
we started Pyomix, is that I, I share the other side. You'll never hear on Pyomix push 3 dBs at 60 hertz and you'll get a good bass drum. That's absolute garbage. That's not how you're going to do it. Is it useful for that one bass drum, for that one style? This? Yeah, sure, so fine. If you have the, if you download the stems from a, from a song and the engineer tells you what he did, that's going to be useful to you. Any other song in a different key or on a different DAW or for a different converter, all of a sudden it's no longer the same thing. Yeah. What's valuable is to learn the philosophy behind the spirit of what's being done. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the energy that is, that is being put into thinking about the big picture of what you want to do about the song. And then everything else kind of falls in place over time. There's sense. no shortcut, just like learning right. guitar. You have to develop your taste, like you're saying. that You Correct. can't quickly do that. Nope. That helps move forward. And related to that, you, you mentioned it in today's seminar, and I think it's critical kind of in the age that a lot of producers are growing up in, the age of unlimited takes, mm -hmm. unlimited options, no tape so we can record as much as we want, um, or all the plugins, you know, I can have an you know, 1176 and have multiple versions of one, you know. You were deciding whether to commit to a sound going to tape, whether you use a little bit of compression going into the DAW today or tweaking the EQ. Talk for just really briefly about commitment. Like you, you're not. Everyone keeps saying, leave yourself the option to change the sound later. But you were saying, you know, this sounds good to me now. I might hate it tomorrow. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. You know, but yeah. Like this is what I'm feeling right now. Let's just go for it. Yeah. With. Do you procrastinate? Yes. Yeah. Me too. Okay. So without pressure. Yeah. There is nothing gets done. If you don't have a deadline, nothing gets done. Everything get, is up in the air, it's endless. That's why people take a year to do one song. And I used, I, I, used, I never had that because I hate, I hate sure. that. I would always hated that. But people come to me to mix their record and I look at the file date and the first version of the song is like a year old. They're like, what are you doing? What are you? And it's not like, you know, there's like a hundred versions and they've been working on it since. It's not like they did it last year and they gave it to me today. They've been working on it something for a year. What do you do for a whole year? If it's a program track, it's it's most of the time it's at least six months to a year old because it takes forever to do that yeah. stuff. Well, without the pressure of a deadline, nothing happens. It just lingers forever. So I used to record everything totally wrong and give myself as much as as possible and not commit to anything because I didn't know much and because I didn't have any vision sure. or enough vision to feel safe to, make those, to take those risks. Then along the way I realized this one thing. Unless there's enormous negative pressure from the artist or the label, I have always grown and got better by, gotten better by committing and making the mistakes because you don't learn from success, you only learn from the mistakes. Consequently, the minute I started, I, the first few types of processing I put on tracking, I did solely for tone, just because I wanted to get that tone now, and I didn't have the plugin that would do it. Then I failed a few times, successful a few times, but then I noticed that a, the, I just liked it better. It was more fun. Mm -hmm. It's not hardware versus plugin or anything. It's just get that tone, right. and then once you get the tone and it inspires the singer or it inspires the whomever the drummer. Um, then everything sounds better, everything gets faster. It's just a, a lovely way to work. But you have to have the inspiration and the vision. Yeah. Without the inspiration and the vision, you won't know what to do. Either. You won't know what to do, and there's a high percentage of chances you'll fail. Sure. And depend, see, if you buy yourself in your basement, you can fail because you can do it again next week. Yeah. But, but say if you have, I don't know, Jennifer Lopez, um, I mean, how much balls does it take to try something new on a Jennifer Lopez right. mix that's do tomorrow? Right. A lot of balls. I did. You know, and some of those mixes went through, and some of those mixes were uh, rejected. You know, but that's okay because I won't make that mistake again. Yeah. And then I got enough mixes to get through to get the next record that I wanted to get. Yeah. It's a question of um, it's the same as procrastinating to do your taxes. Really, it's like without a deadline and without pressure, you never nothing done. will get better. You never get it done. You'll keep just humming along and not getting better. Pressure is good. I'm going to decide now which take is good, yeah. period. That's it. Yeah. It makes better records. That makes perfect sense. So in the, in the current uh, music delivery scheme and the way it works, mm -hmm. you have to have a lot of outputs. Yeah. Okay? So if it takes you six months to do a song, 
it's irrelevant unless it's a hobby. You know, sure. That's fine. But if you re if you want to make a living of it, you gotta release a record every year. Yeah, every quarter. Minimum. Just do it. Make songs, and that's how you get better. Do you think that that concept alone affects the length of album? Do you think more people are gonna do EPs, like shorter EPs? Is that so just so you, you can do more, like every year release so something? Many EPs. I was so wondering many about EPs. that because yeah. I see that trend happening, so and I don't want to do albums anymore personally because I. I'd rather do six songs and then move on to the next yeah, five. Yeah, it's, it's cost effective to do an EP uh, because the revenue streams are so different. So the, the revenue stream from a single or from a license will pay for an EP, but it won't pay for a whole album. Okay. Depending on the band, and, and I just did the Siri LMA record. We did 16 songs in four days. Wow. It sound, it's the best thing I've ever done. It sounds the best I've ever done. You tracked 16 songs? In four days. Four days. With seven musicians, all live. But those people are Martians. I mean, it's unbelievable how they play and how she yeah. sings. It's, it's just completely insane, right? It's possible in this thing. I said, I don't do 16 songs with you guys. I'm like, we're gonna do 10, we're gonna do them well. And I went to the first rehearsal and I said, okay, maybe we can do 16 songs. Wow. And even with musicians at that level, it was a lot of work. Yeah. I'm doing another guy, a uh, record for another guy now named Jay Stolar. Yeah. And we're gonna do 10 songs. And we did two songs, the first two trial runs to see how it goes, we did them and we tracked everything in two days. So it's not as good as tracking 16 in four days, sure. but it sounds great. And it sounds like I push the faders flat and everybody thinks it's the record, but it's not even mixed yet. It's not even finished, I haven't done keyboards yet. But it's done in a way where the production cycle and everything is designed so I have to be done by November yeah. 1st because we're gonna do another one in the spring. Yeah. EPs are great because you can do them quick yeah. and uh, you can do two a year or you can do one every nine months and then you have a presence. Yeah. Like the times where Peter Gabriel would make a record every six years and, and that was okay, those times are gone. Sure. Um, Thomas Dolby was here this morning and said, you know, I took, a, I took a break. Nobody in the room knew, I mean the people in this room, but here most people don't know Thomas Dolby. He's an absolute genius. He just disappeared because he had no output. Sure. You have to have an output, yeah. and you can't spend six months on a song. That's preposterous. Yeah. You gotta make songs, and that's how you get better by yeah. experience. Right, because then you have more opportunities to finish the projects that you are don't even sound good, so you can move on to the next ones and learn from your mistakes Correct. and keep trying. The, the natural human urge is to refine that one piece forever sure. until it's great, because you don't want to be caught with your pants down. Right. The reality is that if it's not good, very few people are gonna listen to it anyway. So finish it and move on to the next one. The next one will be better, more people will listen to it. Sound advice, that makes sense. It's, it's working for the people I work with. Yeah. Um, this artist named Will Knox. We Great album, by the way. Really fun. Yeah. We had so much fun. Um, met him. We worked on the songs for a year and a half before we recorded anything. Just played them live, we mm -hmm. recorded them and everything. When we recorded the record, we did it in seven days. The preparation was there. Because the songs were good. Yeah. Once it was recorded, it was recorded. You can't push, push inspiration is difficult. Yeah. You know, inspiration comes when it doesn't go. So, and plus the band wasn't tight. And, but after playing all over the place for a year, year and a half, they were really tight. Cool. So we got them in. We tracked the whole record in five days, then it was a day of a dub. But like silly things like bells and gongs yeah. and glockenspiels or whatever. And then I mixed it in like five or six days. Done. And then we did that, it's still selling, and it's three, four years old, it's still selling. Then we did another one, the year after, uh, a six song, five song EP, that came out in the shape of a comic book. Uh, and then we're doing another one in the fall, and then we'll do another one next year. And so we just do, we do those records in 10 days or 14 wow. days, all told. That's great. It's awesome. And it sounds, it, doesn't, it sounds uncompromised. There's yeah. songs on that record that I haven't talked since, even though it was done incredibly fast. Wow. That's really cool. So the pressure, the focus, the deadlines, they all help yep. get the music done and to do it better, and especially yeah. over time. Yeah, because the number one problem that most people is when to learn to know when to stop turning the knobs, yeah. right? You can do this forever, it's sure. fun. But when, you, when, is it done, yeah. when do you stop? Well, that's part of the vision. Yeah. The less time you have, the faster you're gonna stop turning the knobs. True. So that's a that's a good that's a good way to do it. it. Makes sense. Well, yeah, as dude, as we wrap up, tell tell the people that are watching this a little bit more about Pure Mix. What, 
when it got started, what's what's it doing, what's your goal with it, and because uh, I think people that check this out are probably probably if they haven't already going to really like the stuff you're you're doing over there. Okay, fine. Well, PureMix is um, a learning platform for producing and mixing. And the website is puremix.net. N E T. Um, it's the same spirit of what you're doing. Um, our production system is different because um, it's more from a philosophical point of view and um, it's like little movies, you know, hour and a half things. And it's, 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 um, we wanted to make it the number one community place where you could go get information, vetted information right. about how to mix and record. But it's more importantly, a place to learn to develop that vision and that taste. And so we grew from there, and now it's turning into kind of a platform, and there's more and more uh, people adhering to the platform. And we want it to be the space on the internet where you go to to get information on everything recording. Sorry, information on everything related to recording and producing music. Yeah. And so that's what's going on right now. It's, we have great traffic, and it's yeah. a beautiful thing, and soon you'll be on it. Yeah, no, so, I, yeah. I've been following the Pure Mix videos if you haven't already checked them out. I don't know how I stumbled across them, but I knew who, knew who you were and when I saw you teaching, I didn't know you could teach as well as you do. You're, you're engaging, you're fun, you make it interesting. So if you, if you guys are watching this and you haven't seen Fab's videos, go to puremix.net. You've got free ones on there as yep. well you can watch. The site um, is like 60 or 70 percent free. It's yeah, there's just tons of free stuff. And you've got videos, I mean, they've got the one on like even how to listen. Yes. <laughs> the stuff that, that no one, you don't think you want to know. You want to know how to make a great drum set sound or you want to mix that killer vocal. But the stuff that Fab's teaching in these videos, like I appreciate the heart and the spirit of it because so many of, of us and the, the guys that are watching this site, the people that are checking this out, they haven't had the formal training and, and something like how to listen helps them know to bypass all the heartache really because you get to the point which is you got to know what you're supposed to be listening for you'll be able to get there faster with the knobs and with the EQ and the compression and it, it's really really helpful stuff. Well thanks, um, yeah it's, it's a little daunting to tell yourself that you're going to spend X amount of hundreds of hours to produce a video called how to listen, how to listen. or recording levels in the digital domain. You tell yourself, I'm such a fool. Why am I doing this? That, that's, a, that's a good one too. Why am I doing this? Who is going to click on that instead of clicking on the surefire way to make a bass drum sound good? Right. And the thing is that the surefire way to make a bass drum sound good is to know how to listen and to know what the proper recording levels are and to listen to a lot of music and that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so that's why we, we took this approach. We didn't expect it to be this successful. We thought it would take longer, but it's growing up, which yeah. is great. Um, the documented mixes are great too, like step-by-step -step mixes, but really put together in a way where there's 95% information and 5% bad jokes. <laughs> Is uh, that the optimum ratio? For me, that's pretty <laughs> much what it's said. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe like 0.005% good jokes. And the, the, the idea is to not have any waiting time and you get sure. in and everything is organized in a way where you're engaged and you can learn something from every step of the way. Even things that, you know, a lot of people love the uh, mixing, mixing Cubase video, not for the stuff that I'm t talking about, you know, on how to mix the drums and everything, just for my s the way I organize the session, they were like, sure. oh, oh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense, you know, this is how you do it to save time. Yeah. Like, I get so many comments on that, and I'm like, I never thought of that. I never yeah. thought that people would look at that video to figure out how I organize my sessions. Yeah. It's great, you know, I'm happy to give back. Nobody taught me anything, and it was really a painful experience. So I'm happy to be able to give back. And also, I got, I mean, that's not true. I was lucky enough when I got good enough to fall into the circle of some people who were very knowledgeable and were kind enough to share the information with me. People like Chris Muth from Legends Music, George Massenberg, um, people like, you know, all these mixers around me and these producers around me who saw that I, w I was pretty passionate about music, yeah. because it's really about music, yeah. and were willing to take time to tell me that I was growing up, basically. Because most people don't take time to do that. Yeah. And most people say, hey man, that's great, keep, keep yeah. going man, awesome. And then George Massimo would say, oh, you suck. I'm like, hey, we're supposed to be friends. He said, yeah, that's why I'm telling you sure, you I'm suck. Sure. And, then, uh, and, then, and then two years ago, I played George the Wilnox record, and he said, that is the best sounding thing I've ever heard. 
Wow. And I was like, wait, then you pull a camera somewhere. <laughs> Do that again. <laughs> true, yeah. yeah, it was nice. That's cool. That was really nice. So the, the, the idea of Pure Mix is to, um, since I'm very in touch with the, how it feels to be by yourself, learning, and I've been lucky enough to be successful enough that people will trust what I say sure. because my track record speaks for itself. Yeah. And also I've developed a, a, a pro, a, an entertaining way of sharing the information where you don't yeah. want to bang your head on the wall in yeah. boredom. Um, those three combinations made pure mix what it is at yeah. this point. And then we're growing it into something you know, yeah. where you're going to have guests um, and we, we have lots of great ideas. No, that's exciting, man. Well, if you haven't already, go check out puremix.net right now when this is over. Check out the free videos. Um, you've got, I've watched them all pretty much and you've got an excellent teacher. You're a great teacher which makes it fun to watch. You're fun to watch but also like you said his track record. He's mixing top-notch records and so you get to look over the shoulder into a guy who's doing it in the thick of it uh, for major label talent right now and get to see his workflow and kind of borrow it and have eye-opening experiences. So go watch it, subscribe, Appreciate you. Thanks, Ryan. So, I know you have a busy week doing Thank this thing much. here. Yeah, but, uh, yeah it's, it's fun. Thanks for having yeah. me here. Yeah, I appreciate okay. it. Definitely check out the Pure Mix. Fab DuPont. Appreciate your time, buddy. Ciao.